I suppose it's good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm a transport economist. They do exist. Um, I normally like to start with something slightly humorous uh, in, in talking briefly. I don't feel I can do that today. Uh, the very first person I, I spoke to this morning was a lady who told me she'd lost her business of 70 years. And I'm sitting in an ivory tower pretending to know what I know to talk about. So uh, I'm humbled by the presence here and the people who really matter. Um, I've spent a few, a few years, more than I care to count, on competitive markets in transport. And uh, the one thing that seems to come across every time is that once you start talking about economics, Everybody has a textbook view um, of Economics 101, but they don't understand the market. Um, we're talking about competition in the market, but we're also talking about a market that is specifically intervened, a market that is not naturally uh, provided uh, without some intervention from uh, operating uh, support from councils and governments. This is indicative of an important aspect of market failure. And we are facing something which is ostensibly good. Ostensibly the right thing to do is to seek to produce better supply for less money. But this is not necessarily the right operation or the right approach for something that is a long-term commitment to people. We commit ourselves to the provision of services to our young and our students. And this is a long-term commitment. The loss of small operators in the market is not conducive to long-term stability. I think I need to just display, describe some of the contexts in which this has become such an important issue. And underlying everything that we know, governments have got less money. My country is bankrupt. Some others are as well. And the context for delivering services in a point of reduced, budget, uh, reduced budgets makes it important for us to understand not only the short-term abilities to save money, but the long-term abilities to secure services. We have a continuing desire to provide schools transportation, and that is a given. We have a series of prevailing thought processes from our civil services. Services that provide advice to ministers and provide advice on processes. And there is a perceived value in centralising procurement. There is a perceived value in identifying ways to reduce costs in the short term. This is not appropriate to all services. We have an onerous RFP process, which you have more experience of than I do. An RFP pre-process that in itself is the problem. We have the existence of predatory pricing and illegal activity in my country from people that should, can, and do undercut on price. We have a separation between transportation, education, and social aspects of transport in government that we are not able to link together all of the aspects of transportation planning. Separates, separate thinking processes lead to separate results. I'm going to touch on a very few number of things in, in the seconds I have. Talking of evidence and some of the things that came up. Our Office of Fair Trading and the Competition Commission between them in 2011 indicated that bus service provision from larger, operator, larger operators indicate, suggest behaviours that do not necessarily reflect to true competition. This is the larger operator taking advantage of their size and weight. Some citations, Wheaton from 2008 talks about the RFP adding a layer of complexity uh, that confuses the process. And we see this being followed by lots of other authors, including Bamal and Sidak, uh, suggesting that it's removing genuine contestability. 
And there are figures to back this up. In Germany, in 2006, at the outset of a competitive process, there were 7.5 bidders for every tender. In 2007, that number had fallen to five. In 2009, there was 1.8 bidders for every process. It's not the fact that competition is wrong, it's the fact that the process is preventing it. France, 1995, 2.5 bidders for every core. In 2002, it's down to 1.1. We're close to one sole provider, and that cannot be competitively sensible. Trying to think of how we can optimize the system, how we can advise and how we can talk to our elected representatives in their civil service. To provide a knowledge of cost structures and service expectations on the part of a commissioning authority, suggesting actually, guys, they do not necessarily know what the costs of operation are. We need to ensure that the ability of a large range of small suppliers is there to compete. This is not being achieved by allowing the process to prevent application. We need to consider, measure, and account for a wide range of economic benefits. The local economic benefits that a company brings, rather than the multinational benefits from a, I hate to admit this, Scottish operator, <laughs> whose name I have forgotten. <coughs> To ensure that the process, we need to ensure that the process in itself does not create a barrier to entry, that it ensures market contestability, and it takes account of local knowledge and local ability to supply. School boards all have a need to understand, to measure and report performance standards to know the impacts of their actions. Ministries have to have the information to establish and continue to provide equitable based funding. And we need to be able to track costs so that we can see issues arising as they arise. I wanted to try and think of the five things that would do the most benefit. And I think people here have presented very well the case for a vital service. People, particularly procurement agencies, need to know costs. They need to recognize and account for the impact of the processes by which contracts are awarded. They need to recognize predatory pricing. And I believe they need to reject bids that do not encourage proper supply, including those which are attractive but too low. Ladies and gentlemen, that sums up uh, my thoughts.